It is with special joy that I welcome back to San Diego, Dr. Robin Clark. Robin Clark is director of the Artists Initiative at San Francisco Museum of Art. She is an art historian and curator whose work has long encompassed intersections of contemporary art and architecture and the conservation of modern materials. Prior to joining San Francisco MoMA, she worked as an independent curator contributing essays to catalogs on artists like John McCracken and Robert Overby. She was assistant curator and a contributing author to the Eva Heath retrospective exhibition and catalog produced by the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art in 2002 and was curator of the Currents exhibition series at the St. Louis Art Museum from 2002 to 2007. Her more recent exhibitions and publications include Automatic Cities, the Architectural Imaginary in Contemporary Art, and Phenomenal, California Light, Space, Surface, as part of the Gettys Pacific Standard Time Initiative. She joins us today to consider Ken Price's 1961 work, The Sea of Sin, in context. And I invite you, by the way, to see Ron Nagel's exhibition, which is pretty much related to Ken Price's work. Welcome, Robin. Come on on stage, please. It's really nice to be back in San Diego. I flew in last night, and the city was really beautiful by night, and uh, Spencer Finch's beautiful uh, light lanterns overlooking the water are, are a treat when you see them after not seeing them for a while. Um, I'd like to thank you for having me here, especially on the occasion of um, these two really impressive exhibitions, very different but complementary. Um, Gauguin to Warhol, um, 20th century icons from the Albright Knox Art Gallery, and Ron Nagel, Peripheral Cognition. Uh, like many people who studied art history, um, focusing on the 20th century um, in the US, um, the Albright Knox collection has been um, a touchstone that we turn, return to over and over um, in reproduction, but very few of us actually get up to Buffalo <laughs> to see it. And so it's um, really a treat that, that the uh, collection's on the road and um, coming to us and to other um, lucky people in other communities. For this talk, I, was, I had the nice exercise of being invited to select a work from any work from the show um, and speak about it. And there are so many, um, it wasn't easy to choose. Um, and I almost spoke about Robert Irwin, um, an artist I have great respect for, and his wonderful um, early line painting in the exhibition is quite beautiful. But in the end, I thought um, Ken Price's small assemblage sculpture called The Sea of Sin was the one that I chose. Um, and it might be um, an anomalous choice. Um, it is, um, especially in a show that's um, comprised mostly of now iconic and often physically imposing um, modernist paintings. Um, but in terms of the aesthetic developments of what was contemporary art in Southern California circa 1960, Ken Price was both an influential and innovative artist. Um, and something Sally said earlier that I think is interesting to keep in mind is that many of these works were acquired when they were uh, when they were contemporary, when the artists were not so well known, when their positions um, within the history of art were not at all assured. And um, to think about them with that kind of energy around them instead of the, the kind of um, entirely understood and respected position they, they seem to now hold is an interesting exercise. Anyway, um, the Sea of Sin seems to act as a kind of a, a hinge or a bridge between the many grand positions taken in the Albright Knox show and the diminutive yet pungent and eccentric work of uh, Ron Nagel. Um, I think um, it's extraordinary how those two installations um, complement one another. The, the great um, elegance and expansiveness and space that's given to the big Albright Knox paintings is very beautiful and impressive and as it should be. Um, but I really think that the Nagel works can hold your attention just as firmly um, because of the way they're installed for what it many people is kind of eye level um, and the, the wonderful lighting and the boxing and that um, intelligence with which the exhibition was designed really um, enhances the the, the fact that really small works can have a very strong presence, and that is uh, completely um, 
important also in considering Ken Price's work. Um, so the apparent modesty of Price's intimate works, for example, um, this assemblage is only about eight inches high, um, both invite and reward close attention. Um, in them we find vertiginous adventures in scale, um, energetic displays of recombinant forms, and what I would call a voluptuous approach to materials that is by turns visceral, absurd, and poetic. The Sea of Sin is an assemblage work made from a combination of found and fabricated elements, including collaged paper, tempera paint, terracotta clay, and a wood box with a glass front. And um, those are the materials as printed in the catalog, but to that I would add that there must be a kind of glossy enamel uh, paint or glaze um, here. This is not tempera. This is something else. Um, that really adds to the, the visceral um, impact of the piece. Price seems to have taken his, in, his inspiration from a cartoon that is glued to the interior of the box, which you can see but not read in the slide. Um, I encourage you to, um, you'll have to sort of um, hunker down um, to see inside the box with the way that it's installed, but, but do have a look at that and read it. Um, in this cartoon, um, there's a life preserver being offered to a figure who is drowning in the so-called sea of sin. Um, the mountain form and surrounding interior of the box are painted cobalt blue. That's the tempera, that kind of um, very matte surfaced pigment that appears to, and, and this blue causes uh, most of the mountain form to appear to be underwater, while the tip of the mound glows a sulfurous yellow, perhaps reflecting sunlight. From the void shape that seems to have been scooped out of the center of the mound, almost like a navel, something dark and glossy seems to be oozing out. And although um, it's not visible in the slide, and this is why close looking in the actual gallery is so important, um, there are several dark um, elements, little like tusks or spikes or, or teeth, um, inside the opening of the ceramic object. So if you in the gallery, look carefully in here. There's a lot of activity. Um, there are multiple frames. So you have the frame of the box, and then you have the frame of the void. And inside each one, telescoping in, there's still more activity. Um, the careful housing of the object within the, within the box with its simple latch seems to suggest that it could be removed for closer study if necessary. The tableau is both poetic and, and, and enigmatic, like a riddle. A look at the trajectory of Ken Price's work over a career that spanned five decades will help us to put this piece in context. First, a few biographical notes about Ken Price, who was born in Los Angeles in 1935. He grew up in Pacific Palisades, where his interests included jazz and surfing. And that might sound like a kind of gossip magazine gloss, but both are important because of the improvisational nature of jazz um, influencing his work and also um, his close relationship to the ocean um, and to water um, as both metaphor and literal imagery um, comes up quite a lot in the work. He completed a Bachelor of Fine Arts with a focus on ceramics at the University of Southern California in 1956 and also a Master's in Fine Arts at New York State College of Ceramics in Alfred, New York in 1959. And that was the most famous um, and influential ceramics program in the country. And Price, as a kind of prodigy, I think they described him, did the two-year program in one year, the first person to do that. In 1957, he studied at the Los Angeles County Art Institute, which later became Otis, uh, with Peter Volkos, um, the ceramicist. Volkus' virtuosic work, sculpting monumental slabs of clay, was associated with the muscular and existential approach of abstract expressionist painters, including Willem de Kooning, about whom we heard so many interesting things this morning, Jackson Pollock, and the Pollock painting in this exhibition is unparalleled in my opinion, just extraordinary. Franz Klein and Joan Mitchell, among others, all of whom are well represented in the current exhibition. Volkus's work and his seriousness of purpose were very influential for Price, although in many cases Price internalized large scale into tiny works of art and tempered his rigor, and he was a hard worker, with a robust sense of humor. He didn't think that seriousness and humor had to be um, antagonists. 
1960, Ken Price had the first of three solo exhibitions at Ferris Gallery in Los Angeles, where he also participated in a number of group shows during the 60s. And these are all incredibly well documented now um, with quite a few catalogs and two documentary films. The whole ethos of that moment at Ferris has been uh, very well explored and was also explored in depth through the, um, the Getty's own Pacific Standard Time exhibition called Pacific Standard Time. After the closing of Ferris, um, Ken Price showed with Nicholas Wilder, Rico Mizuno, and James Corcoran in Los Angeles, all kind of visionary dealers at that moment, and with Leo Castelli in New York. Um, so clearly from the beginning, he was not marginalized, although he chose clay as his medium, which um, typically was not taken so seriously. In the early 1970s, Ken Price moved with his family to Taos, New Mexico, where the landscape, community of artists, and distance away from the commercial art world were conducive to his work for a time. He spent most of the 80s in Massachusetts and the 90s back in California, where he returned as head of the ceramics department at his alma mater, USC. In 2002, Price returned to New Mexico, building a studio and home in an expansive arroyo just north of Taos, which is breathtakingly beautiful. In 2010, Price and his son Jackson opened something called Studio B, where they began making larger sculptures with bronze composite and polyurethane paint. Uh, that was dur and These pieces are durable enough to be placed outside. So that was toward the very end of his life, um, Price was able to start making, if not ma monumental, um, quite substantial works that could be seen in the landscape, which is interesting because from his very earliest works, um, you know, such as um, the Sea of Sin and some others that I'll show you, he's, he's putting sculptures in a, in a tableau landscape. And then finally, when he and his son build this studio and they can industrially fabricate the pieces, suddenly he's putting his actual sculptures in the landscape, which I think was a wonderful development for him. Um, Ken Price passed away in early 2012. In late fall of that year, a major retrospective of his work opened at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art before traveling to the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas and the Met in New York, which is quite a tour. Price worked very closely with curator Stephanie Barron and architect Frank Geary on the selection and design of the show. And Geary was associated with all of the artists who were showing at Ferris from the 60s onward. The show is exquisitely lit with a combination of natural and artificial light and thoughtfully photographed by Frederick Nilsson. Many of the images in this presentation are Nilsson photographs made for the LACMA show. Price's first Ferris exhibition included works such as this one, Avocado Mountain from 1959, which in its sense of mass and gestural application of pigments relates to abstract expressionist painting of the time and also to the work of Peter Volkus. Um, this piece is, um, just so you have a sense of it, about two feet tall, which is quite large for Price. Soon thereafter, Price moved to a brighter, more pop-oriented palette and crisper surface finish. Um, but retain the bulbous forms of the so-called mound or mountain sculptures that are clearly pre precursors of the central element of the Sea of Sin that we just looked at, and to related works such as this one called Astronauts in the Ocean. Um, you can see um, a little bit of the collaged element on the side of the box for Astronauts in the Ocean is a newspaper photograph of an astronaut, and Price is then sort of taking this um, flight of fancy to imagine perhaps the space capsule as it crash, land, crash lands into the water. Uh, this is 1961. Uh, Price's subsequent fair shows include works from his egg, specimen, and cup series. Just to remind you of this. Um, with the egg-shaped pieces measuring about six inches high and the even smaller specimen pieces, um, which were sometimes presented like relics or fetishes on stuffed pillows. Um, Price developed the tension of opposites that became a hallmark of his mature work, I would say, right around this moment. Beautiful in their delicacy and saturated hues, these objects also strike some viewers as repellent, suggesting insidious and uncanny infestations. There is a narrative aspect to the display of the specimen sculpture uh, which rests on an elaborately crafted velvet pillow and stanchioned pedestal, um, which he um, soon leaves behind. Um, 
Um, and here's one of the larger egg sculptures. This one's almost a foot tall, and I'm proud to say it's in the collection of the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Um, writing about the egg and specimen pieces of Price um, in 1966, Lucy Lepard explained, quote, the clear-cut, strongly colored outer form conveys a toughness and modernity, while the dark, glassy orifice and tendrils, with their suggestion of a teeming, damp, cool substratum, bring to bear most strongly the organic metaphor that is responsible for the sculpture's extra-formal fascination. At the same time, um, there is still a narrative strain in Price's work. Um, he made a series of ceramic cups attached to the forms of small water creatures like frogs, lizards, uh, snails, and turtles. Um, this piece called Blind Turtle from 1968 is presented in a box of sand, a theatrical approach linked to the early assemblage works of the Sea of Sin and Astronauts in the Ocean, and like them taking ins inspiration from Didi dreamy meditations on the coastline. During the 70s, Price continued to work with the ceramic cup in two very different series. The slate cups are built from rough edge sheets of clay, suggesting broken bits of slate, or considered on a larger scale, perhaps they suggest eroding cliffs, while the geometric cups feature cubes and boxy shapes, each plane of which supports a different luminous and transparent color. In the 1980s, the geometric cups led to more architectonic vessels that combined the cantilevered composition of the slate cups with the precision of the geometrics. A key example of the later group is Wedge, I show you here from 1981, which conflates forms of a modernist house, an ancient cliffside dwelling, and a Turkish coffee pot. The planes of Wedge are pigmented with delicious hues of red, ranging from maroon to crimson, and outlined with thin pinstripes of creamy white. Another example of this series is called Hawaiian. Um, and you see similarly um, architectonic references and a, and a joyous use of color. And also the kind of uh, gaping void that we see starting with the Sea of Sin sculpture. Throughout Price's work, the seductive and suggestive possibilities of color are consistently foregrounded. In a lecture given at the Chinati Foundation, Price explained that he wanted, quote, to make the work look like it was made out of pure color, end quote. And that goal was certainly achieved in many of his pieces. Consider, for example, The Pinkest and the Heaviest from 1986, a two-part sculpture consisting of ham-sized slabs with crusty brown skin that are notched open to reveal slick pink interiors. It is as if Price unearthed a new kind of ore from New Mexico's earth, and it was made of lipstick. This is a nod to the wonderful Ron Nagel exhibition. It's a piece by Ron Nagel called Trick Tracy um, from 1998. So it's paralleling the 90s, which is where we sort of are right now in, in Ken Price's trajectory. In light of the wonderful survey show of Nagel's work running concurrently with the Albright Knox collection show, this seems like a good moment to point out that Ken Price and Ron Nagel were colleagues and friends. They both spent time in Volkus's studio early in their careers, uh, Price as a student and Nagel as um, a studio assistant to Volkus. And then in the 90s, they taught a series of summer ceramics workshops together at Anderson Ranch in Colorado. You can see in Nagel's work a different approach to texture and form than Price. For example, Nagel's works are also chiefly frontal, while Price worked very much in the, in the round. Um, after, once he gets past the box assemblages, his works are completely different from every angle and really do need to be circled, whereas Nagel's are, are um, persistently frontal. For example, I saw this piece for the first time today in the gallery, and I'd assumed from this photograph that it was two kind of ice cube shapes superimposed but actually the one in front is, is quite flat. It, the, his works are, are really flat. You see them photographed frontally and they seem to have volume and then you look to the side and they're very, very skinny, which is an interesting and different approach than Ken Price. Having said that, um, they share a very sympathetic engagement with saturated color and a tendency to make objects that are extremely charismatic in spite of their small size. Um, Ariel Plotek, who curated Plotek, who curated the um, Nagel exhibition, has described Nagel's work as alien confectionery. 
and I, I like that um, way of thinking about this work. Um, but we return to Ken Price um, and the kind of uh, trajectory of his career. Um, further explorations of both color and scale appear in his works such as Hunchback of Venice, which is the name of this sculpture from 2000, a piece that splays out laterally, balancing precariously on two undulant flanges. Advancing on this piece, a perceptual inversion that proves to be common in Price's work is already evident because what initially appears to be a green thing speckled with orange closer up becomes a violet object marbled with lavender and flecked with orange and green. As the critic Dave Hickey observed, what looks like solid color from a distance, quote, dissolves into a galaxy of interstellar dazzle at arm's length, end quote. In this way, among others, including a serious playfulness and a rapturous embrace of color, Price's works can be seen to parallel that of his one-time neighbors in, in Pacific Palisades, Charles and Ray Eames. The familiar Eames film titled Powers of Ten, which explores the concept of orders of magnitude in a visual essay. Um, for the first half of this 10-minute film, the beginning focal point, which is a picnic blanket in a park, you might remember, is viewed from 10 times further away every 10 seconds. The blue orb of Earth quickly becomes visible, followed by the Milky Way and the outer reaches of the known universe at that time. Reversing this course, the Eames cinematic lens scopes back toward the Earth, penetrating the skin of a man on the picnic blanket, delving down to a cellular level and further still to the realm of atoms, which it is discovered, um, where it is discovered that swarming electrons resemble the points of light that comprise the solar system. This is a notion as profound as Eastern mysticism and as whimsical as Horton Hears a Who, the Dr. Seuss story in which an elephant discovers a civilization embedded in a tiny speck of dust. Allusions to space travel and science fiction also feature in Price's sculpture. Consider a cluster of works including Venus and Mo, both of 2000. That's, that's Mo, and that's Venus. Um, these recall aliens and their interstellar ships as portrayed on screen from B-movies of the 50s of Price's youth up to Futurama of the recent past. I almost said the present, but I know it's over. Price played up the science fiction references to these works with a series of impish drawings, including Roadside Aquatic Sculpture from 2000, which features Venus as the Loch Ness Monster. That's Venus, but sadly I don't have a copy of the, that drawing. Um, but here is a related work, Levitating Sculptures from 2006, wherein the artworks are deployed as hovercraft, and another, the unexpected roadside sculpture, which gives you um, another read into Price's sense of humor. We have seen that untoward tendrils, protrusions, and orifices are compositional elements that appear early in Price's work and recur throughout lending humor and a touch of the uncanny to many of his sculptures. A piece like Arctic from 1998 uh, may perhaps call to mind a snowdrift with tonsillitis or any other um, associations you might have. It seems to be both melting and metastasizing in a curious combination of biological and landscape metaphors, its frosty white giving way to a thousand tiny pin pinpricks of scarlet. I wanted to talk for a minute about the way Ken Price wanted his work to be presented. This is something that shifted over time. Um, Mid-career, he had an exhibition at the Manil Collection in Houston, and installation photographs from that show um, have dramatic spotlighting. It's a dark gallery, and then you have these kind of spotlights um, on individual sculptures. Um, Price moved away from that at a certain point, um, no doubt through the influence, par th partially through the influence of um, Frank Geary. Um, so to give you a sense of the lighting design of the Price retrospective at LACMA, um, I'm showing this image. Um, you can see here a combination of natural and artificial light in the galleries through skylights and windows. Um, and also, it's not so easy to see, but in the background, or even more obliquely on the side. Um, Frank Gehry constructed these large uh, vitrines for the display of the sculptures that are meant to echo the boxing technique that um, Price used himself early on with the early sculptures, um, like the Sea of Sin and Astronauts in the Ocean. 
one of the most engaging aspects of the previously mentioned Ken Price show at LACMA was actually the exhibition poster, which functions as a kind of visual cliff notes to the show um, and reproduce nearly all the featured sculptures in chronological order and to, to scale. The works are represented in relative scale, another invitation to appreciate the formal variety and recurring themes in Price's work. The poster resists framing because the object information for each work is printed on the back, um, right on the back of wherever the thing appears on the front, mirroring the composition of the images. The titles of the pieces, arranged in a grid, read like a block of concrete poetry and underscore Price's improvisational ingenuity. Circling back to the Sea of Sin, one sees already in this early work aspects of Price's ability to suture attraction, repulsion, and humor in endlessly inventive combinations. With the concurrent exhibitions of the Albright Knox collection and the Ron Nagel retrospective, you have the opportunity to consider Price's work in two compelling contexts. The dominant mid 20th century modernist discourse in the United States. I mean, I realize it has wonderful earlier European works, but I'm really focusing on the mid century moment of the large gallery. Um, represented by the Albright Knox collection, and also the work of his friend and colleague Ron Nagel, a fellow West Coast iconoclast. For further reading, I recommend Douglas Dreischboon's catalog of the Albright Knox collection exhibition, Stephanie Barron's catalog of LACMA's Ken Price retrospective, um, Lucy Lepard's essay in the 1966 exhibition um, that LACMA did, which was a two-person show of Ken Price and Robert Irwin, and finally, um, Ariel's catalog um, for the Ron Nagel presentation here. Thank you for your time.